All right, we are recording this review session. So does anybody want to start off with a question, or do you want to just go ahead and jump right into lecture 11? What's that? Just jump right in? OK, let's just jump right in. OK, I'm with you. All right. So let's go ahead, jump right into lecture 11. Okay, so the first part of Lecture 11, which you probably are very familiar with now, is anatomy. And I can tell you that there will be one labeling exercise with anatomy. It won't probably be this simple. This is a little too simple. <laughs> so the urine, after it's formed, is delivered into the ureters. Right, it flows down the ureters to the bladder and then it's eliminated from the body by the urethra. Just remember the kidney is outside the peritoneal cavity. All right, there's a peritoneal membrane. This is the parietal peritoneum. And the kidney actually sits outside that peritoneum. That's why it's called retroperitoneal organs. This is a very complicated slide, but it really is just introducing the term retroperitoneal. I would say this is a good candidate for labeling on the exam, right? Just know the difference between the renal cortex and the renal medullary region renal medulla or renal medulla, however you like to pronounce it. This smaller cavity is called the minor calyx. And then the larger cavity right here is called the major calyx, which is then the fluids delivered into the renal pelvis. So what's not on here is the renal papilla. This, where the tip of the medullary region, the inner medullary region, and the minor calyx are, this is called the renal papilla. And then you can also see the renal artery, the renal vein, and then of course the ureters, bladder, and urethra. So this is, a, oh, there it is, renal papilla, right there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what's the difference between the renal pyramid and the renal medulla? Uh, the renal pyramid? Is the actual kidney shape? Yeah, right? Um, I would see, say that there's really no difference. Okay. okay. So the renal pyramid is just the darker region that looks like a pyramid, but it is the medullary region, okay. right? It's the medulla or the medulla, whatever, however you want to pronounce it. Okay. This just looks like an upside down candy corn. It's called the renal pyramid, but it's really the medullary region. All right. Any questions, you guys? I would know how to label this one. All right. Um, this gives you an idea of how the nephron, the various nephrons, plural, are organized in the kidney. The glomerulus, right, this bulb right here, is always in the cortex region. And these are juxtamedullary uh, nephron. Juxtamedullary is referring to the uh, medullary region. The loop of Henle dips deep into the inner medullary region and then back up to the cortex region. And then many, many different nephron. You can see here's the distal tubule of one nephron, another nephron, another nephron here. They empty the, the we're going to call it the ultrafiltrate, because it's not quite urine yet. They deliver it into a common collecting duct. Common collecting duct. Now, 
The CCD is the cortical collecting duct. That's at the top here near the cortex. And then the collecting duct goes deep into the medullary region. Across, it delivers the ultrafiltrate. At this point right here, it's urine. It delivers the urine across the papilla into the minor calyx. And then we have a major calyx, and then this is the renal pelvis. Okay. <coughs> now, one thing I want you guys to remember is the nephron is the single unit of filtration. A single unit of filtration. All right, so in this case, the main take home message is that there's two types of nephron. This one is the cortical nephron. Cortical meaning cortex. And the cortical nephron, you can see doesn't have a very long loop of Henle. It's mainly confined to the cortex region. However, the juxtamedullary nephron, they have long loops of Henle that dip deep into the inner medullary region. So if I asked you the question, which one participates in setting up the osmotic gradient in the medullary region? Would it be the cortical nephron or the juxtamedullary nephron? Juxtamedullary, right? Yes. So can animals that have generally cortical because they just do more cortical? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, or they are completely devoid of loops of Henle. They don't even have loops of Henle. Frogs don't even have loops of Henle, which is interesting. All right, now just remember too that there's differences in the names of the circulatory system. These, uh, the circulatory system that surrounds the cortical nephron, these are called paratubular capillaries, paratubular capillaries. See, paratubular capillary. But this, right, these capillaries right here, this is a specialized type of capillary. It's called the vasorecta. <coughs> and the reason why it's so special is because remember this is a typical passive counter current system, right? And it helps to maintain the osmotic gradient that's set up by the loop of Henle. Okay. So, technically, the vasa recta is called the countercurrent exchanger because it's just passive. Everything is just passively transported. But the loop of Henle, because of the active transport molecules, the loop of Henle is called the countercurrent counter multiplier. Okay, so the difference is the countercurrent multiplier, the loop of Henle, uses active transport molecule, active transport properties to set up that profound osmotic gradient within the medullary region. The vasa recta, we'll get to this again. The vasa recta is basically a countercurrent exchanger that just helps to maintain that osmotic gradient that's set up by the loop of Henle.
Okay, so just some really important terms. Anybody have a question so far? Pretty good? Okay, so this is a really important slide. It's, it's kind of, you know, shown over and over again throughout lecture 11 and 12. I do want you to know the different parts of the nephron and what they do. And this slide, this slide actually is, you know, more descriptive, but it, it's saying the exact same thing. It kind of gives you an information about major function and controlling factors, puts it all together. But I'm going to go back to this slide. I want you to make sure that, remember that the glomerulus is where filtration occurs, right? The glomerular capillary, capillaries are under very high pressure, which forces fluid out of the circulatory system into Bowman's space and Bowman's capsule, which is then forced into the proximal tubule, PT proximal tubule. So the main thing with the proximal tubule if you just remember one thing, it's reabsorption, okay? In the proximate, proximal tubule, this is where most of the reabsorption occurs. 100% of the nutrients, which includes all of your filtered amino acids and all of the filtered glucose, gets reabsorbed. You, want to, you don't want to lose that. You shouldn't have any proteins in your urine. You shouldn't have any glucose in your urine. It should all be reabsorbed back into the body across the epithelial cells that line the proximal tubule. 85% of the bicarbonate is reabsorbed, 70% of sodium and potassium, and 70% of water. So, Again, if all you remember about the proximal tubule is reabsorption, then you're doing a great job. All right, so then the fluid within the tubule flows down into the thin loops, and it starts to encounter a more hyperosmotic environment, right? It's going from 310 to like 700 to 1200 milliosmoles. So you can imagine as it encounters a more and more hyperosmotic environment, it's going to tend to pull water out, right? Water's going to flow out, and solutes are going to equilibrate. They're going to move in and out, right, until both of them in the tubule and outside the tubule is about 700 to 1,200 milliosmoles. It's going to be very hyperosmotic. So water can flow in and out, solutes can flow in and out until you reach kind of a diffusional equilibrium around the bend here. All right, so then you round the bend, you actually start to move up towards the cortex region. You go into the thick ascending limb, and this is where it gets very interesting, this whole light blue shaded area. You can see here, this is where there's low water permeability, meaning the water cannot follow the solute movement. There's no pathway for water. So because of the active transport mechanisms, which includes the pump, the thick ascending limb is literally pumping using ATP and transporting sodium chloride out mainly in the very front part, right, in the very beginning of the thick ascending limb. Most of the salt is transported out, and as you move up the tube, the tubule, less and less salts, sodium chloride, is removed or reabsorbed. So that starts to set up a very profound osmotic gradient in this region. Water is not allowed to follow. And that's why at the very top of the distal tubule here, it's very dilute, only 150 milliosmoles. This is called the diluting segment. The thick ascending limb is the diluting segment. 
All but 10% of the sodium and potassium are recovered here. Are reabsorbed. Low water permeability, and it forms a very dilute ultrafiltrate. Okay, so remember tubuloglomerular feedback. We'll talk about that with lecture 12. Those macula densa cells can sense the flow rate, the flow through this area, and send a signal right, right here to the afferent arterioles. If the flow is too great or too low, it's got to be in a very specific range. The afferent arterioles, or you can pronounce it afferent for arterioles, the AA are going to constrict. So if the flow is too high or the flow is too low, you're going to get constriction of the afferent arterioles, AA, afferent arterioles. All right, so the ultrafiltrate then rounds the bend. This is the cortical collecting duct and the collecting duct. The main thing here, this is all about fine tuning, right? This is the fine tuning portion in the collecting duct. It's very sensitive to vasopressin. So water reabsorption occurs, but it really depends on how much of vasopressin is present. If vasopressin is on board, then water can be reabsorbed pretty easily, especially as it moves back down into this very hyperosmotic environment. You can get more and more water. The, I, I will say it this way. The driving force, right, the osmotic driving force for the reabsorption of water gets greater and greater as you move down into the inner medullary region so that the urine can be as concentrated. This is where it would be very dark yellow if you analyzed it. It could be as high, the osmolarity could be as high as 1200 milliosmoles. Why could it not be more concentrated than that? Why couldn't you have a concentrated urine of 2,000 milliosmoles. What's that? Yeah, right? You would have to have the, osm the osmotic gradient that's set up would have to have, at the highest point, 2,000 milliosmoles. Right? You can't concentrate it any more than what's established in this inner medullary region. Yeah. Yes. 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 This is a really good question. So for people at home, the question is, what is the sensing mechanism? Why is it that if the flow is too great or if it's too low, why does it constrict the afferent arterioles, AA, right? The macula densa cells are actually using, do you guys remember my favorite co-transporter, sodium potassium 2-chloride co-transporter? Those are, the tra that transporter is actually what's sensing the flow. So imagine, if the flow is too great, then it's moving past those macula densa cells so quickly that there's not enough time for the salts to bind to the sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporter. It's going by too fast. Okay? If the flow is too slow, then there's not enough delivery of salts you're not going to get as many salts binding to those sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporter. Both of them are kind of, right, you're just not going to get the binding of those salts to those transporters if it's too great or too slow. So even though they're opposite, yes, it's still the binding of salts to the sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporter. 
Yeah, great question. All right, so vasopressin at the collecting duct plays a role. Aldosterone plays a role. Uh, the main idea here is that you're getting mostly sodium chloride reabsorption. You're getting mostly potassium and proton secretion. Remember, acid is secreted. By carbon, it is reabsorbed. Okay, same in the collecting duct, sodium chloride reabsorption, potassium and protons, acid is being secreted. In this case, you should get the complete reabsorption of bicarbonate. If you have enough acid, that's actually being secreted. Because what's going to happen, the leftover bicarbonate that doesn't get reabsorbed, so that 15% of bicarbonate that ends up in the collecting duct should bind to some of the protons that are being secreted, converted to carbon dioxide, and then freely reabsorbed back into the body. Okay, so you should get complete reabsorption of bicarbonate by that mechanism. If you're alkalotic, you guys remember what that means? If you have alkalosis, you don't have a lot of acid in your blood, you're not going to get acid secretion. And so you're going to start peeing or excreting, getting rid of excess bicarbonate. Okay, so the bicarbonate that remains in the collecting duct will then be eliminated, excreted by the body. Okay, uh, water permeability also regulated by vasopressin. And don't forget that urea is also regulated by vasopressin. You're not only getting water reabsorption, but urea is also the uh, reabsorption of urea is enhanced with vasopressin. Yes? Um. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's how I think about urea permeability. Let's just say that you do have vasopressin on board and you start to um, reabsorb a whole lot of water. In essence, you could accumulate water in the intermedullary region and it could start disrupting your profound osmotic gradient that you established with the loop of Henle. So if you're reabsorbing water, why not just reabsorb urea with it so that you maintain that osmotic gradient? So in essence, yes, urea is a nitrogenous waste, but it's also a very important osmolite in the kidney. So just remember with water being reabsorbed, urea is also reabsorbed to help maintain that osmotic gradient. Okay. All right. If you need more text associated with this, this actually gives you a really nice, right, description, more for verbal learners, more of a description of the major functions and some of the controlling factors. Don't forget the Stirling forces, right? This is our equation. Hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries minus hydrostatic pressure in Bowman space minus the oncotic pressure in glomerular capillaries. The oncotic pressure in Bowman space is eliminated because it should be zero. Unless there's disease, right? All right. Some comparative anatomy, right? If you're looking and comparing aquatic animals like beavers and frogs to the kangaroo rat, which lives in the desert, you can see that the loops of Henle get longer and longer and the renal papilla gets much more pronounced. So the major innovation as animals have evolved, is that the loop of Henle allows the production of concentrated urine and that animals that produce more concentrated urine have longer loops of Henle and a thicker medullary region, right? All right, our four different processes. This is a really big one, filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion. 
Okay, in the past, this has been another um, labeling exercise. So do star this one. This could be the one this year that we use. I would probably give you one of the afferent or efferent, afferent or efferent. I'll give you one of those so that you know which is which. But do know that these are the macula densa cells, juxtaglomerular cells that release renin. Here are the mesangeal cells that also play a role. They are um, stimulated by the macula densa cells. If the flow is too great, it can cause these mesangeal loops. It can cut off surface area within the glomerular capillaries, or it has some effect on the podocytes, the filtration slits to, to close up a little bit to regulate the flow if the flow is too great. Okay, pretty good. All right, so with filtration, the main thing here, I'm going to just skip through this. I think this is more redundant. This is the slide, really, to memorize. I do want you to be able to calculate um, starling forces, right? Just as we learned with the circulatory system, if it's a positive number, fluid is going to be forced out of the capillaries. If it's a negative number, fluid will be absorbed. If the kidneys are working properly, this should always, always, always be a positive number because the glomerular, the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries is so high. 60 millimeters of mercury. And the reason why even the net glomerular filtration pressure is high at 16 millimeters of mercury, that's to help keep the fluid moving through the nephron. Fluid's always going to flow from high pressure to low pressure. Yeah. So, by Starling, what you're doing is that, like, in general equation. Exactly. By Starling forces, I'm, I mean calculating net glomerular filtration pressure. Those are what's known as starling forces. Will that be given? Um, not necessarily, yeah. OK, uh, we'll come back to this. This is mainly going to be in lecture 12. Uh, here's something that I kind of rolled out. You should know this is really just plumbing. This is just an exercise in plumbing, right? Garden hose physiology. If you constrict the afferent arterioles, what happens to the pressure downstream? It's going to decrease. What would happen to the pressure upstream? It's going to increase. That's not the question asked here, but you've all experienced this by kinking a garden hose, right? Downstream, the pressure falls. Upstream, the pressure gets greater. So in this case, the pressure in the glomerular capillaries, this is the hydrostatic pressure is going to fall, which is going to decrease glomerular filtration rate. Opposite is true if you increase or uh, decrease the radius, increasing the resistance. If you constrict the efferent arterioles, efferent, just to help you remember that, then the pressure in the glomerular capillaries is going to go up, and that's going to increase glomerular filtration rate. Remember, glomerular, glomerular filtration rate is a flow. Right? This is in mils per minute. Now, this is where it gets tricky. I mean, even for me as a student, I have to think about this, right? It's the opposite. If you dilate the efferent arterioles, 
this isn't as intuitive to me, then you have to realize that the pressure in the glomerular capillaries is going to go down. It's going to be the opposite if you constrict. So sometimes in my brain, I have to think, oh, how is it going to, how is it going to go if I constrict? And then I just think about the opposite. If you dilate the efferent arterioles, then it's going to decrease glomerular hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries, and it's going to decrease glomerular filtration rate. And again, it's the opposite with the afferent arterioles. If you dilate it, it's going to increase glomerular capillary. It's going to bring in more blood, and you're going to increase glomerular filtration rate. So this can be tricky, but if you just take it slowly, reason through it, then you shouldn't miss any of those questions. All right. I'm always, um, this is very basic with the kidney, and I still get a lot of students that get secretion and reabsorption confused. Okay, so secretion is when molecules are delivered from the capillaries into the nephron. Okay, so that's called secretion. Reabsorption is when molecules are transported from the nephron. And I always think about it this way, reabsorbed back into the body. And if you need a little help thinking about this, you could think about the intestines, right? When you absorb calcium from whatever you ate, when you absorb calcium, you're pulling calcium from the inside of your small intestines into your blood, right? That's called absorption. So think about it the same with the kidney. This is called reabsorption. You're pulling molecules from the nephron and you're delivering it back into the body, back into the circulatory system. Secretion is the opposite. Okay, so now... I can guarantee that you'll see something like this on the exam. Yes? Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. For the four processes, are they in order? Like, Not necessarily. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. You could have, you know, it's you could have not just secretion and then reabsorption. You could have reabsorption and then secretion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It just depends on you know, where some of these transporters are located. So it's not necessarily true that it would be secretion first and then reabsorption. Okay, so this is kind of the application right here. You would probably get some type of question that would say, which substance is filtered at the glomerulus, reabsorbed, and excreted. What would you say? It would be Y, right? That would be substance Y. Substance X would be what is filtered at the glomerulus and strongly secreted, like PAH. That would be X substance X. And then Z would be what molecule is filtered at the glomerulus and reabsorbed, but not excreted. Pretty good? So what would be um, an example of substance Z that we've talked about? Yeah, proximal tubule. Creatinine is not reabsorbed or secreted. It's just filtered. But I would say a good example of substance Z would be glucose or amino acids. They are completely reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. Okay, so good good kind of exercise that there. Um All right, so this is giving you some insight on the transport properties in the proximal tubule, thick ascending limb, and the collecting duct. And they hold a lot of information. I'll go through it really quickly. 
if you see a transporter on the apical side, the apical side is the side that faces the inside of the nephron. This is the tubular fluid, so this would be inside the nephron, the blue side. On the other side of the epithelial cells, the red side, this would be the interstitial fluid. And then the blood supply, the capillaries, would be just over here where my arrow is. So the red is basically the interface faces the blood supply, blood vessels. So if you saw this sodium glucose co-transporter, you should already think that this is the proximal tubule. This is the biggest, this is the tip. If you see sodium or sodium amino acid, you know, okay, this is the proximal tubule. So it uses the sodium gradient to transport glucose against its concentration gradient. Glucose accumulates inside the cell and then you have these facilitated diffusion transporters that allow for glucose to be delivered into the blood. So it's not as complicated as it seems. All the sodium is actually moving, right? Sodium is moving from inside the tubule, the lumen of the nephron into the blood, right? Sodium is also being transported across the basal lateral membrane by the pump. And with the movement of sodium going in this direction, chloride is going to follow paracellularly. This is transcellular through the cell. Chloride is being transported between the cells paracellularly. Okay? And then finally, the last thing, just remember this equation, this reaction, I should say. For every carbon dioxide molecule, when it reacts with water, carbonic anhydrase is the enzyme that converts it to carbonic acid. And then for every carbon dioxide molecule, one proton is secreted and one bicarbonate is reabsorbed. This is really important, right? You're going to see this again on Friday with red blood cells and carbon dioxide transport. And you're gonna see it again in the stomach, the parietal cells, right? Imagine this is how you transport protons into the lumen of the stomach, because you're transporting literally hydrochloric acid into the stomach. So you'll see this, this reaction again. Any questions, you guys? Once you kind of break it down, it's pretty easy. It's not too bad. All right, whenever you see the sodium potassium two chloride co-transporter, then you should think this is the thick ascending limb. What it's doing is it's pulling all of those salts, I mean an enormous amount of salts, out of the nephron and then all of these other transporters are delivering it back into the blood and into the interstitial fluid, right? This is setting up that profound osmotic gradient in the intermedullary region. It's pulling all of these salts out. Okay, so all that chloride is being transported by the chloride channel or by the potassium chloride co-transporter. Potassium is being transported out as well right, with the potassium chloride co-transporter and then sodium by the pump. All right, now what's missing here is this reaction. Carbon dioxide in water forms carbonic acid. For every carbon dioxide molecule, one proton is secreted and one bicarbonate is reabsorbed. It's happening here too, they just eliminated it for simplicity's sake, right? For every carbon dioxide molecule, one proton is secreted and one bicarbonate is reabsorbed. So this isn't as crazy complicated as you think. Just remember this is the one that identifies it as the thick ascending limb. And then this one has everything to do with aldosterone, right? With aldosterone, aldosterone is produced by the adrenal gland 
it travels, aldosterone travels to the nucleus, upregulates ENAC channels, these sodium channels. And if you get enhanced sodium reabsorption, it's going to tend to increase the turnover rate of the pump. This is going to work harder. It's going to bring in more potassium, and you're going to get enhanced potassium secretion. Aldosterone is upregulated. It is stimulated. It starts to surge in your body when you have really high potassium levels in the blood. you got to get rid of it. It can be, cause arrhythmias. And then the chloride is just going to follow the uh, bulk sodium reabsorption. Okay, any questions, you guys? Yes? Uh, good question. So um, I would say you don't have to memorize it. Okay, so amylaride, this is a great question, is a drug that blocks this sodium channel. So if you block the sodium channel, then you're not going to get an increase in the turnover rate and you're not going to get enhanced potassium secretion. These are called potassium sparing diuretics. If I did have a question of, um, about amylaride, it would be worded. Amylaride is a ENAC channel blocker, right? I would, I would identify it. I wouldn't have you memorize it. I would say in the collecting duct, it is the drug that would inhibit the ENAC channel or the sodium channel. So I, like I said, I would lay it out so that you would know what it is. Yeah. Okay, so one other thing, I want to make sure that you guys understand how diuretics work. Whether we're talking about Lasix, Lasix inhibits this one, right, it inhibits this um, sodium potassium 2 chloride GOAT transporter, or if we're talking about amylaride, which blocks this one. Okay, so I might have to do this on the document camera, but if you block these two, this, this co-transporter or this channel, what happens is you get a lot of electrolytes that remain inside the nephron. Okay? So imagine electrolytes, osmolites are building up inside the nephron. That's going to disrupt the osmotic driving force, and you're not going to be able to concentrate urine, right? Because the driving force for the water reabsorption is going to depend on the gradient. The more this is like pure water, the more the water is going to tend to flow out. That's going to increase the osmotic gradient. The more you get solute accumulating inside the nephron, it's really going to disrupt the driving force, and you're not going to have that driving force. You're not going to be able to reabsorb the water because all of the, the water will stay with the solute inside the nephron. So these diuretics, sure, they make you pee a lot more fluid, but you're also peeing out a lot more electrolytes, right? So Lasix in particular, instead of pulling all this salt out of the thick ascending limb, it stays in the nephron, it gets delivered to the collecting duct, and then it gets excreted out, out, of, out of your body. So you lose a lot of water, but you also lose a lot of sodium, chloride, potassium, which could really disrupt the osmotic gradient that the loop of Henle normally establishes. So you can't be on Lasix for very long, right? You'll start to compromise your ability to concentrate urine. And you'll lose a lot of electrolytes, which could cause some arrhythmias. So Lasix is a good quick fix to get rid of edema or a lot of excess bodily fluids but you, it could lead to a situation where you're also getting rid of a lot of salts. Not just water, but a lot of salts. Yeah? So does that just mean, like, in the horse with the Lasix, does that remove the water before they start to expel? Or... No, 
after they have after, so usually they give Lasix after a race or if they start to have nosebleeds after a race. So the effect is already caused by the racing and the pounding and the swelling. And then they give the Lasix to try to get rid of that excess edema, right? So edema is an accumulation of water in the interstitial fluid, right? Usually people that are in heart failure, right? One of the tell tail signs is that their ankles get really swollen, like really swollen. And to combat that, a lot of times Lasix is given. They call them water pills. Like if you ask your grandma or grandpa, they'll say, oh, I'm taking a water pill, you know? And you'll just know that that's probably Lasix. Yeah. Prednisone, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm sure that it, it had something to do with the kidney. Yeah, I just know my grandma had like heart failure. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a good question. I'm wondering if it does have some effects on aldosterone because prednisone is a steroid hormone, just like aldosterone. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there's some crosstalk between the two that causes them to pee a lot with prednisone. I don't know. I'm just gonna. I'm just guessing. So yeah, but I'll look that up. I mean, that's a really good question. I'm sure it's having some kind of effect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So those are transport. Now we went into excretion. Don't memorize any of these. Don't worry about it. Blah blah blah. This is the one to to really kind of look over. Okay. So I'll just make it super easy. I just want you guys to know. What happens with, this is called micturition, right? Micturition, it's a very fancy name for urination. Micturition. Now, what I'm always impressed by is that when you urinate, when you pee, right, you are using all of these different nervous systems. You're using the parasympathetic, the sympathetic, and motor neurons the somatic motor nervous system. So remember the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, these are your involuntary, this is the autonomic nervous system. The somatic motor neurons, this is gonna be your voluntary arm. Okay, so this is skeletal muscle and you have control or you should have control over this, right? Okay, so it's the parasympathetic that is controlling the detrusor muscles that surround the bladder. Usually during filling, when you're just sitting around at rest, these parasympathetic neurons are inhibited. But when you pee during urination, during micturition, these parasympathetic neurons are stimulated causing these detrusor muscles to contract. Okay, so the parasympathetic uh, nervous system is known to, uh, we always called it the resting and digesting, but you can also, there's an acronym called SLUD. It's the parasympathetic controls secretions, lacrimation, which is tearing, urination, which is what we're talking about right here, and defecation. So parasympathetic does quite a lot, actually. All right, the internal urethral sphincter is under sympathetic nervous system control. Okay, so usually, you know, at rest, when you're just sitting around, these neurons are stimulated to contract. So you shouldn't be peeing, these are contracted during filling. But as the bladder expands, right, as you get more and more filling in the bladder, when you're ready to pee, it's that urge to pee, right? That's when during micturition, during urination, those neurons are inhibited. So these, this internal urethral sphincter relaxes. 
but nothing should happen until you voluntarily inhibit the, the skeletal muscle that controls the external urethral sphincter. You've learned since you were three years old how to relax that external urethral sphincter to allow for urination. So, like I said, I'm always impressed that all three of these different types of neurons are controlling micturition. All right, so that is lecture 11. Doing pretty good. All right, so let's go ahead and go through. This is the regulation. With lecture 12, it's all about internal and external regulation. All right, so internal and external mechanisms. So is this kind of coming into place now, you guys? Is this all coming together a little bit? Yes. Slud. Slud? Okay. Yeah, doesn't it sound disgusting? Yeah, it really does. Yeah, it really does. So parasympathetic is all about slud. It all it's almost like sludge. It's secretions, lacrimation, which is tearing, urination, and defecation. Okay, so there is I'm thinking about a nerve agent, sarin. Anybody look sarin up? Nerve agent, sarin? Sarin is either an agonist or an antagonist of the parasympathetic nervous system, but it is a powerful nerve agent. Yeah. It blocks the end plates. Yeah. But I think it's at the parasympathetic neurons. Yeah, it blocks it. Is that right? Anybody? Is it acetylcholine? Yeah. Yeah. Sarin. Anyway, it, it disrupts it, and it can cause some of this. I think it's actually an agonist of the parasympathetic, and it causes a lot of these. Anyway, I shouldn't. I'll look it up. I'll talk about it on Friday. Okay, so do do do. So we've already kind of gone through this. Okay, so remember, there's three intrinsic pathways: myogenic regulation, tubuloglomerular feedback, and mesangial control. And then we'll get to the extrinsic mechanisms later. Remember, there's four of them. All right, I'm going to blow this up so you can see it a little better. Slow. Yeah, you guys are asking great, great questions. OK, so let's go through myogenic regulation first. Myo means muscle. Genic means origin. So in this intrinsic mechanism, it's really originating from the smooth muscle itself. And this is specific to the smooth muscle that surrounds the afferent arterioles. OK? So just imagine if there is a surge of high blood pressure and it stretches the afferent arterioles those smooth muscle cells are going to react by constricting, and it helps to regulate the flow. Myogenic regulation. So now this very complicated little flow chart is a little easier to understand. So the way to read this, if you have it in front of you, is to read down first. That is basically a cause. That is the problem. And then if you go across and then down the right-hand side, that's the effect. That's the mechanism that rectifies the disturbance. So again, this is all about homeostasis. All right, so you have this 
surge in high blood pressure, an increase in mean arterial pressure. So what does that do? It actually increases the afferent arteriolar pressure, which then increases glomerular capillary pressure, which increases glomerular filtration pressure, right? You calculate that, net filtration pressure, which increases glomerular filtration rate, which is a flow. That can be a problem. So to rectify that, what happens is with a surge in mean arterial pressure, you get this stretch in the arteriolar smooth muscle and a compensatory constriction, right? It's trying to regulate flow to keep it within a very specific range. So with constriction, of the afferent arterioles, you get an increase in the resistance, a decrease in glomerular capillary pressure, and a decrease in glomerular filtration pressure, which helps bring the glomerular filtration rate back to normal. So it's technically a negative feedback mechanism. And again, the myogenic is just giving you some information about this is a muscle the, the mechanism originates in the muscle itself, the smooth muscle that surrounds the afferent arterioles. Okay, so remember, I'm going to skip to this one real quick. The reason why this is so powerful is because your mean arterial pressure can range from 80 millimeters of mercury to 180. That is not normal. That's really high blood pressure. And your glomerular filtration rate stays fairly constant because of these auto-regulatory mechanisms, which myogenic regulation is one. So this is a way to really keep your glomerular filtration rate constant in the face of huge changes in mean arterial pressure. So we'll go back. Well, we'll go right here. Let's go through tubuloglomerular feedback. We've already talked about it, so this should be fairly, this should be intuitive now. Now, this chart is read down. It's kind of read counterclockwise, down and then up and then like that. So it is going counterclockwise. So in this case, tubuloglomerular is telling you something about the, the, where it originates from. Tubulo is the nephron, the distal tubule. Glomerular is referring to the glomerulus. And the signal is coming from the distal tubule and signaling the glomerulus. It's tubuloglomerular feedback. So in this case, you get a surge of high blood pressure increases the afferent arteriolar pressure, increases glomerular capillary pressure, and glomerular filtration pressure, which increases glomerular filtration rate. It's very similar to this one. So the cause is the same, high blood pressure. But in this case, what it's doing is it's monitoring the flow in the macula densa. As you get an increase in the flow, those salts can't bind to the maculate, the sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporter well. And there's a series of events that you don't need to know. If you were taking a higher upper level physiology class, you'd have to know the mechanism. But here it's pretty nebulous. We're saying there's chemical signaling after a detection of high flow in the macula densa cells, there's some chemical signals that cause constriction of the afferent arterioles. And that increases resistance, decreases glomerular capillary pressure, and basically decreases glomerular filtration rate. Pretty good? Yes? So did you imagine that they did the same thing? Yes. They just do it like with the two different Exactly. They're two different mechanisms. So it's the same cause. 
two different mechanisms that are um, going towards the same endpoint, a constriction of the afferent arterioles. Okay. Yep. Yes. Why is it a problem if it's high? Yeah, right, right. Um, with an increase in glomerular filtration rate, um, it can cause some serious problems with the integrity of those filtration slits. I call it blowing out the glomerulus. Okay, so if the pressure, the, the mean arterial pressure is too high, then it starts to disrupt the filtration slits and you start to get blood and larger blood proteins that end up in the urine, which is really horrible. Okay, so now you're starting to see the connection between heart disease, high blood pressure, and scar tissue uh, building up in the glomerulus, which can cause kidney disease. Okay, so you need to manage that, right? You need to figure out a way to control the glomerular filtration rate, even in the face of high blood pressure. But you can see over 180, you just can't do it anymore. This is where I would say you start to blow out the glomerulus and scar tissue starts to occur. You get kidney damage as a result of high blood pressure. You can see that you can see kidney disease and heart disease go hand in hand. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty amazing in some regards that you only have so many mechanisms in place. And then when it gets too high, that's when you start getting pathophysiological states. That's when you start getting real disease. Yeah. So it does a pretty good job in this range, but then that's it. That's all you got. Yeah, and so if you think down the road too, as you, if you blow out the glomerulus because of high blood pressure and scar tissue starts to build up and you can't filter anymore, right? Now the glomerular filtration rate is down to 15 uh, mils per day. Uh, that causes high blood pressure, right? So it's a positive feedback loop that pretty much ends in either a kidney uh, transplant or heart failure. Yeah, it's a, it's a spiral from there. Yeah. Okay, good questions, you guys. So why is it important, GFR? It's important because it gives you an idea, just like in that... Um, Gray's Anatomy episode. Measuring GFR gives you an idea of kidney disease. And they, it, they actually use GFR to diagnose you with the different stages. All right. All right, let's go to the extrinsic mechanisms. This is just kind of, this is telling you how the vasorepta is organized, how secretion and absorption occurs, right? You have to actually pull molecules out of the lumen, across the epithelial cells, into the blood. This would be reabsorption or delivery. Secretion would have to occur from the blood supply across the epithelial cells into the lumen. That would be secretion. They, these are giving you an idea. I just went through this just to give you a little bit more intuition about how the osmotic gradient is established by the loop of Henle. As you elongate the loop of Henle, you can actually see that you get more and more profound in the interstitial osmolarity. And remember, these are active transport mechanisms that pull salt out, but water's not allowed to follow in this diluting segment. Kind of looks like this. This is a good way to put it. More and more salt is pulled out, less as you start to reach the cortex region, and it established that profound osmotic gradient. This is called, let me, I'm just going to say it one more time, this is called the countercurrent multiplier. But the vasorecta here 
this is how it's organized. If it was organized like a linear fashion, it would just be collecting salt and then washing it away. But instead, it's like this. It's like a U, so that it maintains the osmotic gradient. Yeah? So you're saying the countercurrent multiplier is responsible for the active transport mechanism that pulls salt out, leaving the water in. I would say it a little bit differently. I would say that the active transport mechanisms are responsible for the countercurrent multiplier. Okay. Yeah. Because you're, you're actively pulling that salt out which then has an effect on the other side, right? See how pulling the salts out actually have an effect on the descending side too? All that salt actually gets delivered back in, right? Countercurrent multiplier. But the vasa recta, because it's, now this is not the way it's organized, just want to make sure that you realize this, this is a hypothetical. This is actually the way that it's organized. This is a countercurrent exchanger because no active transport is required. So it's just the passive properties as, as the blood, remember this is the blood, the circulatory system, as it goes deeper and deeper into the inner medullary region, there's going to be a driving force for water to be pulled out and salts to be pulled in. But then as it rounds the bend and starts going towards the cortex, the opposite occurs. Water will then be pulled in, salts will be pulled out, and you can see there's not much difference in the osmolarity at the top. Like I said, I always think about a red blood cell going through these vessels the shrinking of the red blood cells as it gets into an environment that's very hyperosmotic and then how it regulates the cell volume regulates as it goes back up just is incredible to me that it can withstand those changes in osmolarity yeah just yeah passive properties no atp is required this is not any Active transport mechanisms are involved. No, no active transport is involved. And it's just a way to maintain the osmotic gradient. All right. Do, do, do. Okay. So we're moving right along. Do you know the difference between a diuretic and an antidiuretic? What is the difference between a steroid hormone like aldosterone? and a peptide hormone like vasopressin. Diuretics stimulate the excretion of water. If you take a diuretic, you produce a large volume of water that has very low osmolarity. It's very dilute. Antidiuretics, they allow you to concentrate urine. So it reduces the excretion of water. You produce a very concentrated urine that's usually dark, that has high osmolarity. Steroid hormones like aldosterone, they um, can easily move across the plasma membrane and into the nucleus. So they usually initiate protein synthesis and in aldosterone's case, aldosterone actually initiates the synthesis of those ENAC, those sodium channels, and inserts more of them into the membrane. So it takes about 24 hours to initiate the protein synthesis and then insert those sodium channels into the apical membrane of the collecting duct. Peptide hormones, though, like vasopressin, very quick. The receptor is in the apical membrane. As soon as vasopressin binds to it, within minutes, I'd say even seconds and minutes, it would insert those water channels to help reabsorb water back into the body. So this slide is just kind of giving you some general terms as to how to think about diuretics, antidiuretics, steroid hormones, and peptide hormones. So 
I'm just going to skip through this because the main four extrinsic mechanisms, there's only four of them. I know there's a lot of slides, but you just need to know three intrinsic mechanisms and four extrinsic. One of uh, with the extrinsic mechanisms, it's vasopressin, aldosterone, the renin angiotensin system, and then finally atrial natriuretic peptide. The first three are all antidiuretics. And the last one is the only diuretic of the bunch, atrial natriuretic peptide. That was my scuba diving example. Makes you pee once you start to dive. Great. That's atrial natriuretic peptide. All right, so let's go through vasopressin real quick. Vasopressin is a hormone that is released by the posterior pituitary gland in the brain, right? So you have, just like you went through with your severe dehydration worksheet, you have these sensors in the hypothalamus, and you don't need to memorize this. OVLT, SFO, and the median preoptic nucleus, these are your sensors. Just know that there are sensors in the hypothalamus that are going to detect the high osmolarity. And it sends a signal to the thirst center to basically initiate that thirst behavior. That would force, and this is one of the strongest behavioral reactions that any animal has, that drinking behavior. That urge to find something to drink is, can be very strong. Okay, so that's the thirst center. It also triggers the posterior pituitary gland right under the hypothalamus to release vasopressin. Okay, and that's the next slide here. Vasopressin then travels through the circulatory system, blah, 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 to the collecting, the epithelial cells of the collecting duct where it, again, this is a, peptide hormone binds to its receptor. You should already recognize that this is a GS coupled metabotropic receptor. Increases in cyclic AMP. It stimulates PKA. That causes protein phosphorylation and ultimately membrane fusion of these aquaporin, these water channels, aquaporin 2 that get inserted right into the apical membrane. Aquaporin 3 and 4 are already always in the basal lateral membrane. They're not inducible. They're just always constitutively there. This is the inducible part, right? This is what vasopressin controls. It controls the aquaporin 2 channels to be inserted into the apical membrane. Now you actually have a pathway for water to be reabsorbed back into the body. So it pulls water out of the nephron and allows you to concentrate urine. Anybody remember what inhibits vasopressin? Alcohol. Alcohol. What else? One more. Head injury. Head injury. You could have so much swelling in the brain that it knocks out your ability to produce vasopressin. That would be a neurogenic diabetes insipidus. Neuro mean, you know, neurogenic meaning it's a problem with the brain. Nephrogenic means that there's something wrong with this receptor in the kidney. Nephro referring to the nephron. All right, so if you need a note, some more text, this just walks you through the process that I just talked about. And this is just redundant, right? This is actually telling you that with vasopressin on board, you get 
reabsorption of all this water, which allows you to concentrate urine as high as 1,200 milliosmoles. Without vasopressin, all of that water stays inside the nephron, and you produce a very dilute urine, high volume. Like I said, if you drink alcohol, this would be the case. That's called breaking the seal. <laughs> You just start to pee a whole lot throughout the entire night. And remember that with vasopressin, urea is actually enhanced. Urea reabsorption is enhanced. Without vasopressin, urea stays in the nephron and is excreted. That makes your urea a very important osmolite to maintain that osmotic gradient. All right, aldosterone, steroid hormone that can easily cross the plasma membrane, enter into the nucleus, and initiate protein synthesis of those sodium channels called ENAC, epithelial sodium channel. E for epithelial, NA for sodium, C for channel, ENAC channels. Okay, so this is just telling you something about the synthesis, but this is telling you something about the transport. So the more sodium channels that are expressed in the apical membrane, the more enhanced the sodium absorption, reabsorption, and the more enhanced the chloride reabsorption, this is going to drive the process the pump, you're going to get an accelerated turnover rate of the pump, which is actually going to enhance potassium secretion. So it makes sense that aldosterone is released in the face of high potassium levels in the blood. It helps to promote potassium secretion and excretion. Okay, so I don't know if you guys know this, but if you were reading in your textbook, high blood potassium levels are called hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia. I wouldn't have you know that on an exam, but if I said on an exam hyperkalemia, I would definitely put in parentheses high blood potassium levels. All right, yes? Um, so the increase in having channels enhances potassium and CO absorption? So I would say yes. Okay. So the increase in high blood potassium levels would increase sodium chloride reabsorption. It would enhance potassium secretion. And if there is a pathway for water, vasopressin has to be on board, then the water will follow the sodium chloride movement. You'll get sodium chloride reabsorption, water reabsorption, and potassium secretion. Does that make sense, you guys? Sodium reabsorption, chloride reabsorption, potassium secretion, and water reabsorption if vasopressin is present because vasopressin is going to allow for the water to follow the net solute movement. You see how the kidney is just all about diffusion and osmosis? I mean, it really is. It's just all about diffusion and osmosis, just like we, what we learned before. Usually, water is going to follow the net solute movement. All right, so this is just more of the same. If you have high potassium levels, you're going to get potassium filtered, reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, but then secreted and excreted in the collecting duct. And this is a nice saying the same thing. 
high potassium intake, let's just say you ate a whole bag of dried apricots, which is high in potassium, you get an elevated potassium plasma levels, aldosterone secretion. Oh, what happened? There it is. It's like, oh my gosh, this is a newer computer. I hope it didn't just die. Okay, that was weird. PowerPoint died. All right, uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about real quick is renin angiotensin. Is it quarter after two? No, it's quarter after three, yeah. Whew. All right, so we'll get through 12. We just have a couple more here. And then we can start respiratory real quick. We'll just do the beginning of respiratory. All right. Oops. And then we'll finish up respiratory on Friday too. So, yes, question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so with the mesangial cells, the mesangial cells also receive signals from the macula densa cells. And what they do, real quick, go back here. Uh, let's see, here they are, mesangial cells. So they receive signals from the macula densa cells and they do two things they cause what's called mesangeal loops. So just imagine that this part of the glomerular capillaries gets cut off and it diverts more blood to just a portion of the glomerular capillary, which decreases the surface area and basically decreases glomerular filtration rate. So it can reduce the flow by restricting blood to certain areas of, areas of the glomerular capillaries. That's called mesangeal loops. And then it also can cause, there's a extra glomerular, which are these mesangeal cells, and then intraglomerular mesangeal cells that cause the filtration slits to get smaller and smaller. So it clamps down on those podocytes and causes the filtration slits to get smaller. That also decreases the glomerular filtration rate. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. So let's go to the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. That's the third extra extrinsic mechanism. We've already gone through vasopressin and aldosterone. So with renin, angiotensin, there's really one slide that's important. It is this one. All right, so this tells the entire story. If you just had to memorize, if you wanted to figure out the renin angiotensin, this is the slide to know. Renin is released in response to low blood pressure, just like our severe dehydration, from the juxta, juxtaglomerular cells. Juxta means next to glomerulars, referring to the glomerulus. Juxta glomerular cells. And just so we have, right here are the juxta glomerular cells. So there's low flow in the macula densa cells. It's actually sending a signal to the juxta glomerular cells to release renin. And what that does is renin is an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen, a molecule that's secreted by the liver, to a very small molecule, AA is amino acids. It's converted to angiotensin 1. And then within the blood, the, this is a blood vessel, there's an enzyme called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. And it converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which is the active form of this hormone. And it does two things. 
Just like the name suggests, it's a powerful vasoconstrictor, angiotensin, and it causes vasoconstriction. And basically what's missing here is an increase in total peripheral resistance, which increases mean arterial pressure. It also causes the adrenal gland, which sits right on top of the kidney, to secrete aldosterone. And we already know what aldosterone does. Aldosterone promotes sodium chloride and water reabsorption. And that is going to increase, it's gonna increase blood volume and increase mean arterial pressure. All right, so if you need a, some, a flow chart, this is saying exactly the same thing. Anybody have any questions? Uh, I just want to make sure that you guys realize for people that actually have high blood pressure, many times they're given what's called an ACE inhibitor. And that's really powerful because it eliminates the vasoconstriction and it eliminates the salt and water reabsorption retention. ACE inhibitor. So I saw a commercial. Now I notice all these things. I saw a commercial the other day that said for heart failure, I could hear it in the background. They said, however, if you're taking an ACE inhibitor, I would consult with my doctor. And I'm like, oh, I hope my students actually heard that. Yeah. So ACE inhibitors. All right. Flow chart saying exactly the same thing. Now, finally, this is the last one. This is the only diuretic of the bunch of the three, of the four. <laughs> Of the four. Let's get this straight. Okay, so remember atrial natriuretic peptide is the only diuretic. And what it does is it inhibits all of the other three. It inhibits vasopressin, it inhibits aldosterone, and it inhibits renin. And it's secreted in response to stretch of the atria, right? That's why it's called atrial natriuretic peptide. You get stretch. Distension is just a really fancy name for stretch. You get stretch of the atria, release of atrial natriuretic peptide that ends up in your blood. That causes an inhibition of aldosterone. It actually is missing here, but an inhibition of renin and vasopressin, right, which basically uh, enhances sodium excretion and water excretion. It, cause you, it causes you to pee quite a bit. It's a diuretic. And the example that I used was when you go scuba diving and you're in that horizontal position, especially down at depth, it stretches the atria and like I said, Makes you want to pee in your wetsuit. Only two types of divers, those that pee in their wetsuit and those that lie about it, right? All right. Okay, so these are just flow charts. I would take a look at them at, the, at home. It's just kind of saying exactly the same thing. As long as you understand those principles, you should be able to just fly through those. We're not going to talk about parathyroid hormone until endocrinology, so you don't need to worry about that. Here is the clearance equation. Make sure that you go through the... Okay, so you will need to be able to uh, calculate on your exam. Using the clearance equation, you'll need to be able to calculate GFR and renal plasma flow. It's going to be easy, though. I mean, I'm just giving you the information that you need. How would you calculate GFR using the clearance equation? 
What molecules would you use to calculate GFR? Using the clearance equation, what would you use? You're about to say it. You can say it. Yes! Perfect! Okay. You can use creatinine or inulin, right? These first two, inulin or creatinine. Why can you use the clearance equation, right, and calculate either creatinine clearance or inulin clearance? What special properties do these two molecules have that allows you to calculate glomerular filtration rate using the clearance equation? What's special? What's so special about creatinine? That's right. That's exactly right. It is filtered, but not reabsorbed or secreted. So whatever is filtered ends up in the urine. Whatever's filtered is excreted. So there's no nothing confounding about it. You calculate creatinine clearance or inulin clearance, you're essentially calculating glomerular filtration rate. Why is it that you can use PAH to calculate renal plasma flow? And when I say calculate PAH, what I mean is you're using the clearance equation to calculate PAH clearance. Why, when you do that, are you actually calculating renal plasma flow? Why can you do that? What special properties of, of PAH, what are the special properties that allow you to do that? Yes. That's right. It's freely filtered. So imagine that. It's freely filtered. And what's not filtered, right, goes on to the efferent arterioles, and then it's strongly secreted. So essentially, whatever enters into the kidney, whatever enters in through the renal artery, all ends up in the urine. Nothing continues on to the renal vein. So it's not just filtered, but it's strongly secreted. So every bit of the PAH that enters into the kidney, kidney ends up in the urine. Okay, so PAH, when you calculate PAH clearance, you're actually calculating renal plasma flow. And then you guys know how to calculate filtration fraction because GFR, this is the flow, the percentage that is filtered over the renal plasma flow is the filtration fraction. And it's usually about 20%. So imagine I give you a lot of different numbers. I give you the concentration of creatinine in the plasma, concentration of creatinine in the urine, urine flow, concentration of PAH. You need to be able to take all those numbers, figure out what GFR is, figure out what renal plasma flow, and ultimately just calculate filtration fraction. Just, I want to keep it simple. The hard part is understanding which molecule can you use to calculate which variable, GFR or RPF. All right. Don't worry about dialysis. Okay, so we only have about a half an hour, you guys. This is a marathon session. Uh, here is what you need to know for acid-base regulation by the kidney. This is the collecting duct, really. There's going to be some filtered bicarbonate that's left in the tubule, right? The amount of protons that are secreted are going to combine with the remaining filtered bicarbonate. And when that happens, right, 
you're going to get a conversion of these two molecules to carbonic acid, which is going to produce carbon dioxide and water. In this case, carbon dioxide can be freely reabsorbed. This is a way to recover all of your filtered bicarbonate, every single bit of it. But if you are alkalotic and you can't secrete enough protons, then there will be a lot of filtered bicarbonate that is left over that will be excreted. So in the face of a metabolic alkalosis, you're going to start excreting buffer. And that will bring your blood back into normal ranges. That's going to cause that high pH to be lowered to a more normal pH in your blood. That's one way to recover all of your bicarbonate. Some of the protons are going to bind to phosphates that will be excreted. Now, in this case, you're generating more bicarbonate. And especially with glutamine, right? If you are, have a very profound acidosis, with acidosis, you're going to get enhanced glutamine, sodium, this is a co-transporter, enhanced glutamine transport into the epithelial cells, which are going to increase the secretion of ammonium ions. And you're going to get brand new bicarbonate that's going to be formed and delivered back into the blood. So it's going to increase your buffering capacity. That's the importance of glutamine. It's worth going through what can cause a gain or a loss of hydrogen ions. This covers both the respiratory uh, acidosis and alkalosis and the metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. And here's the response. So this is the cause. This is the response, which is pretty much what I've just been talking about. With the Davenport diagram, a metabolic uh, acidosis and alkalosis, you'll be able to tell because CO2 levels will be constant at 40, at a normal 40 millimeters of mercury. And you'll just toggle back and forth along this line. However, a respiratory acidosis and alkalosis, you can see respiratory, this would be respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, the pCO2 levels are really going to change drastically and you're going to move along this line. This is called the Davenport diagram. All right, you guys, that's pretty much with 12. We've already just recently gone. Um, how do you feel about that? Are you burnt out? Should we go through some of the respiratory stuff? Are there questions or do you want to maybe table this? Yes. Okay, that's a great where let's just start there. Yeah, that's a really good one actually. Okay, I know exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about this one. Yeah. Okay, so the main idea here is thinking about this intrapleural pressure. So Understanding that this interpleural pressure is sub-atmospheric is the important part. I want you to have a mental picture of those microscope slides, right? When you have a little bit of fluid in between, super easy to move those microscope slides up and down. That's the buffer part that helps cushion the lungs. But when you try to pull them apart, you're, it's almost impossible because you're going to get this vacuum. You're going to get this 
subatmospheric intrapleural pressure. And it's important because that intrapleural pressure is exactly the same magnitude but opposite in direction of the elastic recoil of the lung. Okay, so this being subatmospheric actually counteracts the elastic recoil of the lung. And it's technically the pressure difference holding the lungs open. Without it, the lungs would collapse. So that's what's called the transpulmonary pressure. The really important part on the exam is going to be just knowing the, the term, the definition, and then really, you don't have to calculate anything. It's really just going to be the definition. So the transpulmonary pressure is the pressure difference holding the lungs open. It's the difference between the alveolar pressure and the intrapleural pressure. Alveolar pressure in the beginning of inspiration is just going to be zero, minus the intrapleural pressure at minus four. So it's going to be zero minus minus four, four millimeters of mercury. And it opposes the elastic recoil of the lung. All right, the other thing that this intrapleural pressure does is that it counteracts the natural bowing of the chest wall. If you didn't have this intrapleural pressure of negative four, your rib cage would bow out abnormally. Okay, so it holds the chest wall in. That pressure difference across the chest wall is the pressure holding the chest wall in. It opposes the outward elastic recoil of the chest wall. So it is the intrapleural pressure at minus four minus the atmospheric pressure, the outside, because we're just talking about this parietal membrane. Zero at minus, and then that equals minus four millimeters of mercury. So it is this pressure difference that's responsible for holding the chest wall in. It opposes this, this elastic recoil of the chest wall. So what we're talking about is the pressure difference, the transpulmonary pressure is the pressure difference across the visceral membrane. The chest wall pressure is the pressure difference across the parietal membrane. And then the pressure difference across the entire respiratory system, that's the alveolar pressure minus the atmospheric pressure, is determining airflow. Okay, so when it is plus one, that's going to force air out. And if it's minus one, it's going to force flow, it's going to force air in. Does that make more sense? The respiratory system pressure is the pressure that determines airflow. It's the pressure difference across the entire respiratory system. And so now this makes a little bit more sense, this one right here, right? Now you know something about transpulmonary pressure and you can kind of see how differences in increased compliant how that differs with decreased compliance. So with increased compliance, this is an example of emphysema, right? It just takes a little bit of transpulmonary pressure, a little increase in transpulmonary pressure to make huge changes in lung volume. Whereas with cystic fibrosis, that's an example of decreased compliance. Now you have to go to very large transpulmonary changes in that or pressure difference, large transpulmonary pressure in order to just make really small changes in lung volume. Cystic fibrosis. Talked about pneumothorax. You guys pretty good with lung volumes? Okay. Uh, and then what is alveolar uh, ventilation? You guys know how to think about minute ventilation. 
with alveolar ventilation, you just need to subtract off the dead space volume. So that's really important. This is then just calculating the volume of air that is participating in gas exchange. And then you multiply that by respiratory rate. And we talked about this, right? There's a real difference between minute ventilation and alveolar ventilation. It's alveolar ventilation that's giving you an idea of hypo and hyperventilation. You can't determine that with minute ventilation. And then this kind of gives you an idea of hyper and hypoventilation, right? So with hypoventilation, I would just say when you think about hypoventilation, think about holding your breath. O2 levels fall in your body because you're not breathing and CO2 levels accumulate. It's the opposite with hyperventilation. If you're truly hyperventilating, you're bringing in a lot more oxygen into the body and you're blowing off a lot more carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide levels really diminish with hyperventilation. All right. I'll go back. I know that we skipped a lot here, but I'll just talk a little bit about surfactant. Surfactant is um, something that I want you to know. This is actually a really good summary chart. Surfactant's a mixture of phospholipids and protein, and it's only secreted by alveolar type 2 cells, not by type 1 lowers the surface tension, that air-liquid interface, which increases the stretchability, increases lung compliance. So just by sleeping every night, you get alveolar collapse. Again, it's a good idea to just stand up and breathe in deeply that stretch actually causes those alveolar type 2 cells to secrete surfactant, which is going to decrease dead space, increasing the stretchability of those lungs and not allowing for alveolar collapse. That's because it, uh, the surfactant has more of an effect on those smaller alveoli. Surfactant has more of an effect on the smaller alveoli, which equalizes the pressure so that you don't get alveolar collapse. Yes? Could you clarify, so compliance is always the stretchability yeah. of the lung, mm -hmm. whereas um, distension is the stretchability of just the atria? Right. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so... <laughs> yeah, you can use it interchangeably. Okay. Yeah. So distension, and we'll talk about distension when we get to the stomach too. When you eat food, your, your stomach distends. That's another word for stretch. Okay. Compliance is the stretchability yeah. of, yeah. So I hadn't even made, put that together until you said that. Yeah. Okay. You can use them interchangeably, yeah. So here's the law of Laplace. It's giving you the relationship between T is surface tension, R is radius, P is pressure. So if there's no surfactant, the surface tension is going to be the same, and the pressure is just going to be determinant, is going to be determined by the radius. So if the surface tension is the same, if the radius is small, then the pressure is going to be large. There's going to be an inverse relationship. In this case, the pressure would be larger in B, and that would cause the air is always going to flow from high pressure to low pressure, cause the smaller alveoli to collapse. However, with surfactant, you get a decrease in the smaller alveoli. The surface tension really decreases in smaller alveoli, which tends to equal the pressure. You don't get alveolar collapse. This is a good represent. This is something that you could expect on the exam. All right. 
Uh, I would also know the process of inhalation and exhalation. And then I'm just going to, I'm kind of going backwards from the question. I want to make sure that everybody knows that this is the, this is the diagram to memorize, right? And one, one, uh, I always get students that forget to label these bars, the conducting zone and then the respiratory zone. The respiratory zone participates in gas exchange, conducting zone doesn't. So what kind of dead space would you call the conducting zone? Anatomical dead space or alveolar dead space? Anatomical dead space. Alveolar dead space is when you're either not getting the alveoli, you're not getting air in the alveoli, or if you're not getting blood flow around the alveoli. Then there's no gas exchange. That would be called alveolar dead space. All right. So don't forget, you guys, I think that's pretty good. I'll stick around for a little bit longer. Um, I think because we just went over the respiratory stuff, I will stick around a little bit longer on Friday to answer questions, but don't forget the extra credit opportunity in 365 Hacker Hall uh, between 2 and 3 on Friday, okay? All right, you guys. Again, I will stick around a little bit longer on Friday to answer any questions, but I, I can stick around now, too, if there's still some things that you're confused about. All right.